In 1985, Brett Easton Ellis, 21 years old, hit pop culture stardom with the release of his debut novel, Less Than Zero. It was a decade when authors were seen to be at the same level as rock stars and actors, and Ellis was right up there with the biggest of them. Being a part of a seemingly wild bunch of young writers called the Brat Pack brought all the attention he ever could have desired. The Brat Pack was made up of Jay McInerney, Tama Janowitz, Jill Eisenstadt, and of course, Brett Easton Ellis himself. He hung with the right crowd, was seen at all the right clubs, was interviewed by all the right people, and once, he was even commissioned to show all the hotspots in New York City alongside Judd Nelson, fresh from Breakfast Club fame. It was a task they took as a joke and went to the least popular places they could think of. Ironically, their statue was such that a lot of the places they went to and later wrote about, claiming them to be the hottest spots in New York, became in fact just that after Ellis and Nelson claimed they were. Everything seemed to be perfect, just the way he'd envisioned it when he was younger. But something still felt off. He was making all the right steps. He had the right apartment, the right suits, and a reservation at all the right restaurants. But nevertheless, he felt a rising frustration building towards the superficiality and consumerism of the 1980s. He had bought into it, but he didn't feel well with that, and he needed to process this frustration. He had finished a second novel, The Rules of Attraction, which had also been somewhat successful, but he felt detached, alienated, and alone. The partying, the attention, the interviews, all had begun to feel plastic and artificial. He had an idea about what his third novel would have to be, the release it would have to provide, and with it, he would tap into the essence of a controversy even he could not have foreseen. You're listening to House of Words, a podcast about writers, authors, and yuppie serial killers. I'm your host, Jason and Moore Hardin, and today we're talking about Brett Easton Ellis's American Psycho. Published in 1991, but written and set in the 80s, American Psycho took an extreme and satirical look at Reaganism, consumerism, what was hiding in the shadows of American culture, and, maybe more importantly, what was hiding behind the American dream. Here's the backside synopsis from the Picador 40th Anniversary Edition from 2012. Patrick Bateman is 26 and works on Wall Street. He is handsome, sophisticated, charming, and intelligent. He is also a psychopath, taking us to a head-on collision with America's greatest dream and its worst nightmare. American Psycho is a bleak, bitter, black comedy about a world we all recognize but do not wish to confront. Quote, Not being able to find meaning can be just as powerful as finding meaning. End quote. Brett Easton Ellis was born on March 7, 1964, and was raised in Sherman Oaks in the San Fernando Valley. His father was a wealthy property developer and his mother a homemaker. They were divorced in 1982. Ellis has stated that he mostly had an idyllic California childhood. Ever since he was young, he considered becoming a writer as being within the realm of reality. Growing up in a place where near everyone wanted to get into the film business, since Los Angeles is a film industry town, it was natural to have prospects of becoming a writer or a director. It was just how things were. You either became a director, an executive, an agent, a writer, an actor, or something else within the movie industry. In his late teens, he played in a band that seemed to be gaining some attention and success. It was something he really had hopes of pursuing when his parents and grandparents told him that he had to give up the music dream and attend college. It wasn't a choice. He had to. Brett didn't take it too bad as he on some level had always wanted to attend college. But nevertheless, it did flip the idea of where he was headed with his life. 
Ellis was educated at the Buckley School in California before he was sent to Bennington College in Vermont where he first studied music. Becoming more and more fascinated with writing, however, he eventually shifted his focus. Writing had been a passion since he was a child, and he reignited that love in college by starting on a novel. This would later become Less Than Zero and would go on to sell 50,000 copies the first year of publication. He became a well-known name, and his wild antics and late-night debauchery with fellow actor Jay McInerney earned them the moniker, The Toxic Twins. Brett Easton Ellis initially imagined a disillusioned protagonist. Though the character was not yet violent at this point of the development, he was superficial and detached from the life he was leading. Ellis had introduced members of the Bateman family earlier in his career, specifically Sean Bateman, as the protagonist in his sophomore novel, The Rules of Attraction. In the same book, Sean's brother, Patrick, is mentioned for the first time. Unbeknownst to Ellis at the time, Patrick Bateman would later return as the protagonist in American Psycho. Ellis used many elements from his own life or from friends' lives to create the character. Patrick Bateman lives where Ellis used to live, watches the programs that Ellis used to watch, and is detached and alienated from society as Ellis himself felt at the time. He later stated that the similarities between himself and Patrick Bateman weren't coincidences. They were both in their late twenties and both trying to fit into a world they weren't sure they wanted to fit into. That, however, left no other options either. The world seemed to be moving in one direction at the time. Embrace Reagan's all-consuming morale and consumerism or be an outsider. With two rather successful books under his belt, an image of being a young provocateur and coming from a rather rich upbringing, Ellis felt he had something to detach and separate himself from. American Psycho would be that painful step. American Psycho and its protagonist, Patrick Bateman, embodies many of the worst elements of the era in which it is set. Bateman is the personification of everything shallow that the 1980s stood for, consumerism and materialism to its most extreme so extreme that it encompasses torture and murder, gruesome, highly detailed torture and murder. These elements, excluding the affinity for torture and murder, is exactly what Ellis himself bought into when he achieved success at such a young age. An interesting fact in hindsight is that in the novel, Bateman looks up to Donald Trump and Tom Cruise, and Trump is in fact mentioned no less than 40 times throughout the book. When it came time to dress Bateman and create his apartment, Ellis used GQ for his clothes and the clothes of the other characters. The electronics were from Stereo Review. Other than that, Ellis mentioned that it was Fangoria and Vanity Fair that influenced the characters of the novel. Fangoria, of course, being mentioned as a joke. Patrick Bateman was actually not a serial killer to begin with. It was after a dinner with friends who worked on Wall Street, listening to their conversations and observing their mannerisms, that Ellis came to the conclusion that Bateman would have to be a serial killer. Because of this, and fascinatingly enough, the first draft of the novel left out all the grisly scenes, which would be added later when this additional element was introduced. It was an experimental novel for Ellis and not only because he was living the extravagant life that Bateman was living at the time. The novel was also testing the traditional narrative structure. Ellis wanted to push the idea of character development simply by not letting his protagonist evolve through the novel. There may be some changes to Bateman, but in the end, he is pretty much the same person as at the beginning. There isn't a three-arc evolution to Bateman, there is little to no personal growth at all. Quote, You would think that most writers in their 20s would want to fool around a little bit, would want to be a little experimental, would want to write something a little bit subversive, even if it means risking failure. End quote. 
To Ellis, the novel felt like an autobiographical one, later explaining that the tone of the novel accurately reflected how he felt at the time when he was writing it. He goes on to explain that if he had been a well-adjusted happy person at the time of writing the book, it would have been a much different book. It would have been a lot less violent and bitter. The novel appears to have been a cathartic experience for Ellis, a way of dealing with the life he felt was overwhelming, or maybe the life he was expected to live up to. Like with all of his books, Ellis likes to do an outline of the whole book down to the most minute details before starting on the novel itself. This outline incorporates every scene. That way, the book is completely thought through before the actual writing begins. The outline for American Psycho took about three to four months to be completed. The reason he did and still utilizes this technique is because he doesn't see the books as novels in the proper sense, but more based on a concept, based on a vision of what the book will be. First, he likes to find a character he wants to write about. He then finds the voice of the protagonist, and it is with this voice that he is able to set up the structure of the book and the language he wants to use. In the end, this determines the plot, story, and the length of the book. Instead of the other way around, which is to have a plot in which to drop a character into. With this book, he would also have to do copious amounts of research, which in a time before the internet actually meant seeking out and reading books. Criminology textbooks, he read every pulp and true life crime book he could get his hands on, and he read as many books on Ted Bundy as he was able to find. He did this for about a year, which he called a lousy year of reading as he had to go into everything true crime podcast listeners relish in learning about now. Oh, how the times have changed, huh? <laughs> American Psycho began with Ellis wanting to write a story about a detached individual. Then that individual became a serial killer, which meant that Ellis would be able to explore writing a book from the viewpoint of someone who kills people. He wanted to set it in New York since that is where he was living at the time. From that, he could structure the story, all along letting the voice, Bateman's voice, guide him forward. When all those elements were placed in order within the outline, he would commence writing. Though Bateman had turned into a serial killer, Ellis didn't want to delve into his backstory. He didn't want reasoning behind his murderous thirst. He didn't want to explore or reveal a childhood where he had been mistreated by his parents and or rejected by the opposite sex in his teens. He did not want to establish reason. To Ellis, there was no reasoning behind why Patrick Bateman did what he did. To him, Bateman was a creature who just existed, who just was. He began writing the book in the fall of 1986, before he did the rewrite on Rules of Attraction, and he finished what he assumed would be the final draft in December of 1989. Concerning the more violent and gruesome scenes, Ellis admitted that they did affect him and has said it did a number on him psychologically, though one he can't describe. These grotesque chapters consumed him completely, and he has stated that he cried at times while writing them. After finishing American Psycho, he knew that he would never write anything like that again. Here's a fun fact concerning his writing routine, particularly later in his life. Ellis liked to make his bed before writing. It helps him to have things clean and tidy before getting down to writing, which is ironic considering the mess he sometimes spills onto the page. Quote, I had thought the response of the critics, like the response from anybody, was really important. In the end, I found that it's really not so important. You write for yourself. It's between you and the typewriter." End quote. Four months after Brett Easton Ellis submitted the book to his original publisher, Simon & Schuster, 
they told him that they had no intentions to release the book. Story has it that a few women at the company refused to work on it, but that wasn't the reason Simon and Schuster didn't want to release it. They simply felt it was too much, too deprived, too ugly. They told him that he could keep the advance they had already given him, but they were not releasing the book. One can wonder if they regret making that decision or stand by it considering the infamous status it has gained. Backlash and criticism of the book was expected, but the amount and intensity of it was not. Least of all, it wasn't expected by Ellis. The National Organization of Women attempted to organize boycotts. Stores refused to order it. Ellis was 27 years old at the time of the book's release, and he was suddenly in the position where he had to deal with death threats, over a book nonetheless. About the National Organization of Women, Ellis said it very clearly in a 1991 interview with Rolling Stone. Quote, People like those in the NOW coalition can't seem to divide the two things, being shocked and being offended. People seem to think that shock equals outrage, that if something shocks you, then you should be outraged by it. Being shocked by cultural artifacts, movies, poems, songs, photography, more often than not can be a healthy, liberating experience. End quote. Ellis never felt like a part of the literary establishment. The cancellation of the book did not come overnight. They had faced more than a few problems in the eight months leading up to it. So when the book was dropped, Brett wasn't shocked. It affected him, but after a few days, he received word that Vintage Books had picked it up for Random House, and they were publishing it. Random House did ask for some of the violence to be cut, but Ellis refused, and they backed off as he had been given free reign. He was already working on his next book at that point, but being able to get the novel published in the way he wanted was a boost that hurt him. Though a boost, the novel would be a headache for a long time coming. American Express complained about their card being mentioned in the book as it was used to lift cocaine to Bateman's nostrils. Bad reviews followed. One of those was in Vanity Fair, written by Norman Mailer. Mailer, it goes without saying, didn't like it. He wasn't opposed to it being published, but he wasn't willing to defend it either. Ellis would tell in interviews that Bateman was based on his father, his abusiveness towards his mother and him, as well as his hunger for money and status. But later he backtracked and admitted that Bateman had not been based on his father, but on himself. It basically came down to feeling more comfortable with using his father as a scapegoat. The backlash of the book had been steadily growing since the release, and his father's ways not being far from Bateman, with buying into the plastic age of the 80s, it just became easier to blame him instead of facing even more trouble. But in the end, it wasn't about his father. It was about him, with the twist of his father's image. Ellis wasn't really sure, nor did he care at the time about how many copies it would sell. He didn't bother with worrying about how many people connected with it or did not. He had other reasons for writing the novel. He has later stated that the novel was truly a product of its time, a moment where he was thinking many of those thoughts and questioning his own lifestyle. It's not a book he would have written now, and he believes it's not a book that would be published now. The book has later been better understood to be a satire than it did at the time. The absurdity of it, the overindulgence of sex and violence, seems to have become apparent to the readers of future generations. In that respect, it was a book ahead of its time. He never reread the book until he was working on Luna Park more than a decade later. He is very self-critical of his work and always finds things he wants to alter or change, so he avoids reading his old novels, which is something I'm sure many of our writers who are listening 
can relate to. Through the years, it's become more of a mythological piece of writing. Still sold in Australia in wrapper, and still shocking, it holds a great power, and the graphic descriptions of murder and torture are still harrowing. Vivid depictions of gruesome murders of women, men, children, and animals naturally made it very controversial. But that is unfortunately a reason many missed out on all the other elements present in the story. The elements that take up the biggest part of the novel. Though I would argue that those elements are much more entertaining and important than the killings, it is a fact that many of its first-time readers choose to pick up the book precisely because of the legend it has garnered. I suspect that it is only later, on repeated readings, that most readers have come to appreciate all the other different themes and nuances the novel has to offer. After the worst of the controversy settled, Ellis released a collection of short stories called The Informers, which were mostly written before American Psycho. It would take seven years between American Psycho being published and Ellis' next newly written novel, Glamorama, to come out. Glamorama would be another satirical novel, and this time he would push it, some would argue, even further. Patrick Bateman would eventually make another appearance in Ellis' works, namely his novel Lunar Park, alongside fictionalized versions of friends like Jay McInerney and Brett himself. As always, let me leave you with one final quote from the author. I like the idea of a writer being haunted by his own creation, especially if the writer resents the way the character defines himself. End quote. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode and will spread the word about the podcast. Once again, I have been your host, Jason Nemore Harden. I, along with the show's creator, ask that you please consider making this show easier to produce and more frequent by contributing on our Patreon page. Until next time. Keep turning those pages. House of Words is written and produced by Crystal M. Sanchez. Narrated and written by me, Jason M. Moorharden. And music by Creature9 and Wood. All rights and ownership belong to Crystal M. Sanchez and Jason M. Moorharden.